All right, so we're here. We're for, well, we're here for the Grappling with Physio podcast, and um, we've <laughs> we've had a bit of a, a mess getting this set up, but that's all right. Uh, we're joined today uh, by Mark. Well, with Mark Tucker. How are you, Mark? You all right? I'm very well. Um, thank you, Paul, for having me on your podcast. No problem, mate. So Mark is the chief instructor at the Com- Combat Athletics Academy down in Liscard in Cornwall. Is that correct? I pronounced that right? Yes, you did. Yeah, it's a strange place, but yes, you pronounced it correct. Super stuff. So, Mark, um, you, you're here because of a couple of recommendations. Steve Brown, who's one of your brand belts who I had on the last episode, said we got to speak to Mark. And also Mick Tully, who's a local native to Coventry, also messaged me and said, get you on and have a chat with yourself. So you've got some fans out there, mate, who want to obviously hear the story. And I'm sure there'll be other people that want to know uh, a little bit more about yourself, Mark. So okay. I, I could introduce you, uh, but I'll probably make a pig's ear of it. So if we go back to when you were in the Royal Marines and then go from there and then we'll move to where we're at now. Okay, um, I was a Royal Marine many, many years ago. Uh, I left in 94. I then went on to doing um, private security work, everything from maritime security to close protection. I then went into um, security in Iraq and stuff like that. Um, I then went on to become a professional MMA fighter for my sins. And now I'm a full-time martial arts coach as well as holding a nine-to-five job down as an open safety executive. That there is, you go. That was the, the short, short version. The short, short <laughs> there are, there version, are yeah. so many avenues that we could go off <laughs> from there. When when did you first join the Marines? What year did you initially join? 88. I think it was 88 or 87. I can't remember exactly. Right. Uh, 80, 88, 88, yeah. Okay, sum up in a few words what going through training was like. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not going to say training was easy by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I come from, um, I know we've had a conversation there, but, but I come from quite an hostile family where I didn't really have anything else. So it was either get through training or have nothing. So for me, it was a necessity to get through training. Um, and every day was a challenge. Um, I'm only five foot six. Um, I'm not the biggest of people. I'm not necessarily the strongest people. I'm not necessarily the fittest of people. But I took every day in bite-sized chunks and just got through every day as best I could. And then the next minute, I went from being on the platform at CTC, the train platform, the first day I arrived, to leaving as a commando at the end of training, which took me by surprise, really. Um, and that was pretty much it. And then I was uh, initially sent down to 4-2 commando, uh, where I served as a GD Marine, and I did my Norways and my Caribbeans and all that type of stuff from there. Okay, it's GD General Duties. Yeah, General Duty Marine. General yeah, Duties, just a, yeah. Crowd, yeah okay um, yeah and um yeah so I, I had lots of aspirations when i was in the marines doing different things um i suffered a motorbike injury which pretty much knackered my leg which then basically put me in situations where um i was being pit on like rear parties and stuff like that there and um i wasn't able to do the things i wanted to do and the aspirations i wanted to have i wasn't able to fulfill um, so I ended up basically signing myself out and then going into the security industry. And then I started traveling the world doing that. How did you find that transition into the kind of like private security industry? You've um, been an ex-bootneck. Uh, yeah, it, it was a weird one. It was a strange one. Um, it was a lonely one as well, because um, when you're in the core, you've got the support of all your colleagues and your friends around you. When you go into the, into the private industry, it's pretty much a maverick style environment where it's all about each themselves. It's the, to find people that are there to be part of the team and to work with other people is quite hard. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a bit of a transition, but I quite fast found myself as a team leader um, in maritime security. In Iraq, I found myself as a team leader. Um, so I was able to then to develop the team as I, as I saw fit. It may not be right or wrong, but it's how I saw fit. I was able to develop the team to do the tasks that we were given from there so yeah was that quite kind of like hard thing to walk away from or you know because i know like the money can be great and uh you know it can be very lucrative is that like a is it an age thing that where you just say like there's only so long i can do this for etc or does it become 
you know, very kind of stressful and you just think, well, I, I'm not, I can't sustain this for much longer? Um, it doesn't matter who you are. You're not going to sustain it for that long. Um, it doesn't matter who you are. We all have that point at which we just realise we can't do it no more. Um, for me, um, I lost a couple of friends in the security industry out in Iraq because um, of an IED. And I came back and I've got a, a daughter now. Uh, she's in her 20s, a young a daughter. At the time, she was very, very young. And I started realizing every time I come home, because you do three months away, a month off, a month, three months away, every time I come back, it was a different child. So I was pretty much missing her childhood, if that makes sense, um, chasing the dollar. Um, yeah, it was quite good money and all the rest of it, but I lost the majority of that through a bad relationship anyway. So to me, it was, yeah, I came out of it at the end of it with nothing through lots of mis- personal mistakes. So. What, what was the kind of pivotal point where you thought, right, I'm, I'm leaving this, I'm not going back to it? Um, that's a good question. It would have to be uh, watching friends or losing friends around me. Uh, the last one, I wasn't actually involved in the patrol, um, and we were based in Kuwait basically. And we were taking, we were taking, um, we went up to Navstar over the border. Then we would pick up a convoy or the protection detail that we had, and then we'd go to wherever they wanted us to go. We could go into Basra, we could go to Baghdad, uh, we could go to different locations, and that, depending on what the task was. And um, a couple of my friends went out on one of the easier tasks and that, and they got IED'd. Um, and that pretty much really scared, not scared, yeah, scared me. It did scare me. I'm not going to say it didn't scare me, but it did scare me. And I just thought to myself, it's a, it's a numbers game. The more you can put yourself in these environments, eventually something's going to go wrong. And you can't, you can maybe go into it one or two times, a dozen times, two dozen times or whatever. But eventually, the more you do this, statistically, the odds are stacked against you. And like I said, I had a young daughter and I was missing her growing up. So I thought I need to step back from that. I still stayed in the security environment. I was doing um, things like World Superbikes, Formula One. Um, I was doing concerts, um, rock, uh, pop concerts and looking after different people and diplomats and that type of stuff. Um, so I was still within the security industry. I just wasn't in that uh, hostile environment, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Have you, have you heard of Nick Dunn or have you ever read his book? No, he, no, he was no, no. he was the paratrooper. There was, I think, there's quite a few ex paras, and they were the maritime security, and they and they, and they got um, they got held in prison for quite, I think, it was about four years. Uh, his books, uh, I think, it's called Surviving oh. Hell. And, yes, and they I were do used. Know, I do know of him. Yes, I do know of him. I have heard that story. Yes, wasn't that? Um, didn't they get pulled off the coast somewhere? And they were. That's right. Yeah, I, I remember. I've heard a little bit about the story. I don't know the full details about it. I've got the book. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll send it your way, mate. I'll send it to you. It's a really good read, but it's it's scary. And, it, it, you know, I'm, I was reading it at night and it was, you know, I was thinking, oh, God, God. Oh, you know, I'm when, I'm when, and, and, and Nick, you know, you're an absolute legend to get through what you've, you've done through because he is, I think he's struggling a little bit, you know, every now and again, he's open about his PTSD, etc. But But um, when you read the book, you can understand like it was, it was rough and he was they were used as a, essentially political pawns you know and, and that, that's the, that's interesting what you said about having a security network of essentially the country behind you when you're representing the armed forces and then to be yeah. a private security a, a security you got, agent you got nothing, you got nothing, nothing. yeah you're a pawn essentially yeah yeah we were we were, when i was in iraq we were working for the coalition of provisional authority um and uh Basically, we were, we were given tasks to do. We did the tasks, but we had no, no support, no support whatsoever. Um, you, know, it was, you were pretty much a, a, a lone man with the three or four people you got around you in an hostile country, in an hostile environment. Um, and it's really weird because even, even the armed forces that are in country are actually quite hostile as well. Um, we came across a turned over Umbi. Um, and uh, one of the US soldiers inside was hurt, and we pulled up beside it. Um, they were actually going to shoot us, and we had the big orange um, tax signs on the vehicle and all the rest of it. Um, it took a while to get to them. We, we offered our help. We finally managed to get them out. But at first, they thought they didn't want to risk who we were, they didn't know who we were, and they were quite prepared to shoot us. Wow. Um, and, that, and all we were trying to do was help. If that makes sense. Yeah, it'd not be like American forces to shoot uh, British forces, would it? <laughs> so, yeah, so we had, we, I mean, so we had lots of incidents just like out there, and um, uh, 
yeah, it was just strange, strange environment. Very, very strange. But every time we we, we went into one of like Basra or whatever, and we we come across quite a lot of the British services and all the rest of it, we were always given support. It was just out on the ground. We had no communication links with them. Um, yeah, we, you're just a lone person operator. Lone I, I, person. I always remember when we, we were going into Kosovo, we had a Coldstream guard attached to us and he was there, uh, I think in 95 in Bosnia when that initially kicked off and uh, they had him give a presentation to us and he actually got kidnapped, um, sandbagged and taken prisoner and, and then, um, yeah, the, 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 uh, the, the Bosnian forces ha- had hold of him. <laughs> and, it, and obviously it gets escalated up the chain of command. Next thing you know, you've got a company of warriors Okay, with support company, Milan platoon, mortars, all ready to go to rain absolute hellfire down on this location, unless they hand them over. <laughs> yeah, you know what well, I mean. And, and he, yeah. he walked, he walked out. He 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 was given back to the company, and uh, you know he said, "Look, I, I I took a kick in. They gave me a bit of a bashing, etc. <laughs> and you, you stick to the four things that you're supposed to kind of talk about." But he said, within the space of two hours, there was like a, a whole company of Coldstream guards you know, like on this location saying, right, you got our boy, give him back. And I suppose you don't get that with the private security aspect of things. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, yeah, see, see you later. It's like one of our concerns was if anything were to happen to us, would we get repatriated? You know, and I know it's a really weird um, thing to think about, but we always get told in briefings there were certain things in place for us and all the rest of it. But when you actually look in it, their chances of repatriating you were so remote, it's unreal. You know, so um, yeah, it was it was it was a, a usual times. Um, the money was good. Um, yeah, but, you know what I mean, looking back now, I'm pleased I've done it. Um, I've got some pretty pretty cool pictures. Um, I've been to places that a lot of people won't go to unless they are military and stuff like that. I've met some pretty cool people, done some pretty cool stuff. But would I do it again? Probably not. Or if what I would have done this time was not ride motorbikes, not break my leg, and I would have stayed in the Marines. <laughs> Hindsight's an amazing thing, isn't it? <laughs> How was that uh, adaptability phase? You know, like that when you got when you stopped doing the, the that kind of private security. How how long did it take you to kind of settle? I suppose into the um, Yeah, um, I don't think you I don't think you ever really settle it as a civilian because even in the role I got now for a really really cool company, um, and I'm an health and safety manager within the company. Um, I couldn't ask for a better job. Um, I've really, really landed on my feet. But a lot of the reason why I got that job is because I have got that military style attitude in me, if that makes sense. So I don't think you ever lose it. I don't think, um, and do I want to lose it? I don't think I want to lose it either because um, it makes me different um, to the majority of people, if that makes sense. And um, I'm very, very regimented and I do things in a certain way. And my employees like that. Yeah, and I will say, I, I personally think the reason I got the job and the chance to do this job is because of my previous record. So, I mean, I don't think, yeah, I don't think you'll ever change. It is what it is. You might start eating a bit more, a, bit, a few more burgers and the rest of it, not going for as many runs. You might put a bit of weight on, but I don't think things change. Do you not think there is an element of adaptability, though? Because if you don't, you can kind of get left behind. You do have to adapt oh, and, and learn how to let go of a few yeah. things, etc. Yeah. yeah, you have to. You have to you have, yeah, you will. You will. You will adapt a little bit. Um, I let people. I let. I understand that people won't do things the same way I do them. Um, but instead of where before, I would get probably irate about it or whatever it is. What it is, I'll still do things my way. Um, I still iron my shirts for work in the morning the same way I did when I was in the Marines, you know, so I'll go to work every morning with my, my shirt iron the same way I did then. Well, um, full, of, full of creases. Full of creases, <laughs> <laughs> all, the, all the square creases. Like there, just kind of it. The collar's up like a rugby player. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah so, um, but I understand. But I, I, I have adapted from the point of view that I am I'm more willing to let people be themselves if that makes sense so I, i'm aware that civilians maybe do things differently and i am aware of that um the bit i struggle with is when i come across colleagues that are ex-military as well and they've got nothing about them if that makes sense they've got no pride in themselves uh they've got no pride in their work ethic um and i'm surrounded by quite a few people like that um in everyday life if that makes sense i've got 
I've got one end of the spectrum. I've got colleagues like Steve that you know as well, who is impeccable on everything he does. And, 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 and he's got that standard about him. And then I've got other colleagues that are in the military and you mean they turn up in the mornings and you just look at them and think, oh my God, were you really in the military? You know, so you, again, it's about letting the person live their own life and do their own thing. And as long as I get up in the morning and I do what I believe to be right, then as far as I'm concerned, it's a win-win and they can do what they want to do. So, so as, as, as well as running this job, which is full-time, you also run, you know, your, your BJJ school, martial arts, the MMA school, um, yeah. and you've got black belts in quite a few other kind of disciplines in regards to grappling or contact sports, martial arts, etc. cetera. Let's, let, yeah, let's talk about the school. How, what's it like? Well, because you're the only black belt down in that neck of the woods, aren't you? Um, no, I'm not the only, I was the first. In BJJ? Yeah, BJJ black belt, yeah. yeah. There are a few other black belts down here now. Right. There's, there's, um, there's I've got, uh, so I think one, two, three under me now down here. But you're the uh, highest ranking one. I'm the highest ranking one, yeah. I'm yeah. the longest, longest served black belt. I was the first black belt in Cornwall. Um, I was the first blue, purple, brown, and black. Um, uh, I've been a black belt now 10 years. This is my 10th year, something like that there, um, as a black belt. So, yeah, and I've, I've promoted three people um, to black belt down this way. Um, and obviously there's some other clubs that have got black belts under them down here as well. I think there's about probably about six. Six black belts, six, seven black belts down here now. Um, so it is, the sport is growing. BJJ is growing, um, which is quite good. Um, and the good thing I like about it as well is there's lots of individualism within styles and concept of how they deliver their training, if that makes sense, which is quite nice to see. Well, let's, let, let's talk about that. What Because I suppose you would essentially be one of the kind of like pioneers who were in it and the early stages when it really kind of hit the UK, um, you know, before the likes of, well, even probably before Mauricio landed in Birmingham. Um, I, uh, I think Mauricio, I was actually at a seminar in Edinburgh, which was actually, it was, it was a Guru Dan and seminar at Rick Young's Academy in Edinburgh. And the guest instructor uh, was actually Mauricio Gomez and Hodger Gracie. And if I remember rightly, Hodger was a blue belt at the time. They've come to this country. So the, the, I think the wheels had already started turning for these people. Um, so I was basically just in behind all that, those types of people. Um, I saw Brazilian, because I used to do judo at the time. I did a lot of judo. Um, I was a county champion, all that type of stuff. Um, just loved the manhandling of people. And then I got to witness Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Really, really liked it. Um, at the time, Rick Young was doing a lot of it who's a phenomenal uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. I, I do believe he was, there were three of them all at the same time, but their black belts were from Mauricio Gomez. He was the first black belts in the UK. Um, I think it was Mark Warder, uh, Jude Samuel and Rick Young. I may be wrong, don't quote me on that, but I think it was those three together. And they got it off Mauricio back in the, however long ago it was. Um, and that pretty much, started getting me to look into it a little bit but at the time there was no things like to get a black belt or to get anybody underneath you there was nothing around um i finally managed to get my blue belt off hoist gracie when he was doing the seminar circuits in the uk i went to a load of them and i finally got my blue belt but a lot of that was because i had a new waza background and i was doing as much um grappling as i could with other instructors around um, but it wasn't technically brazilian jiu-jitsu so i had a little bit of an head start and then back then, um, blue belts were able to teach Brazilian jiu-jitsu um, and set your clubs up and do all that type of stuff. And then um, over the years, um, with the the birth of the UK BJ Association and other controlling bodies, now they put stipulations on you. I think it has, you have to be a purple belt now to, to teach Brazilian jiu-jitsu and so forth as it moves up through, which I think is good. But back in the day, there was very few, I was the first blue belt in Cornwall, there was very few any coloured belts down here um so we had no choice but to teach i suppose that, well i mean at the beginning of any sport or martial arts that's the situation is what it is and that's dictated that particular situation yeah. if, there, if there is anybody else then blue belts are going to have to teach i mean it was great uh, and i chatted with dan strass about dan strass about this 
how uh, the UK BJJ Association has now recognised it. BJJ is a recognised sport under Sport England, and yeah. uh, you know clubs can apply for funding. They kind of, you know, you've got to supply a rank structure, etc. Like what you said about purple belts teaching, as long as you can prove provide or prove your lineage and say that yes i'm teaching under so and so this is my hierarchy etc yeah. and, and and it's good do you think do you think though like with the development of the sport do you think that it's been watered down because you hear that a lot don't you like oh it's been watered down over the years or do you think that it's developed and it's gone beyond that it, it depends what you want for it from it really isn't it it's not about it being watered down things will develop things will grow things will mutate and all the rest of it it's about what the individual wants from it. I have lots of people say to me, what type of jiu-jitsu do you teach? Do you teach sport jiu-jitsu? Do you teach self-defense? I teach jiu-jitsu. What you do with it's up to you, if that makes sense. You know? Um, yeah, I won't be teaching these dynamic guards, upside down barambola or anything like that. Um, I'm just not physically, you know what I mean? Into that type of stuff. You know, I'm more of the, the pressure game, top game, um, controlling, pressure passing, all that type of stuff. Um, so we've all got different skill sets and that's where I levitate towards because um, when I come up through the ranks now there wasn't many competitions in the UK either for BJJ so I was doing a lot of MMA at the time so most of my um, my grading periods under Pedro Besser because he gave me my purple my brown and my black I was actually competing in MMA and uh, um, like Cage Rage back in the day um, Bama Cage Warriors in New Zealand and stuff like that there so Yes, I did get to go off and do some IB, IBJJF tournaments in America, stuff like that. I did the, um, the, Euro, uh, the Worlds, I've done the Europeans and that type of stuff. Um, but there wasn't much around at the very, very beginning. So I think the, the, the mutation of it, I think it's good for the sport from the point of view. Um, it allows people to adapt and it brings a level of athleticism into it, which is really, really good. It's a bit like MMA. When it, at the first MMA first came out, it was art style against style. And then all of a sudden, it's all about athlete against athlete now, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think any any martial art, um, there's no such thing as a, as a bad martial art. I think any martial art as a, I think it's down to the individual. Okay, I mean you can take you can take what you may call a really bad martial art, and you put somebody who's really athletically gifted into that martial art, and all of a sudden that martial art becomes really good. You can take what we call or what you may believe to be a really dynamic martial art and then you get somebody who's not so athletically gifted, not so competent in their skill set, and then they make it look really, really bad. So I, I, I think it's the individual more than the art, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Do you think, um, you know, the way you said there's not a bad martial art, if you're not heard of that Dillman character, <laughs> you know, the one who does the no-touch, no-touch yeah. knockout. <laughs> The thing is, right, it's, <laughs> my, my view on it, um, my, my view on martial arts, my view on this here, right, it's, it's like religion, okay? If it makes, there's all these different religions out there, okay? I don't think there's anything wrong with any of the religions. Um, I'm not religious in any shape or form, but I know lots of different people that follow different religions, okay? Now, as long as that religion makes them feel good and it gives them peace and all the rest of it, and it gives them a little bit of self-esteem and all the rest of it, that religion's right for them. You know, now if you've got Dillman and he's running around doing whatever he's doing and people are following him and they're feeling good about it, um, you know what I mean? As far as I'm concerned, he's giving them something, you know, and rightly or wrongly, you know what I mean? It's not my cup of tea, but rightly or wrongly, he's giving these people something and they're going off. Maybe it's a post sense of security. And yes, and you and I both know that the chances of these things working, you know what I mean, are quite remote. Um, but he's doing something for those people if that makes sense brazilian jiu-jitsu is not for everybody you know mma is not for everybody um i teach carly that's not for everybody muay thai is not for everybody um so it's about the individual person finding the religion that's right for them and making something from it if that makes sense hang on mark there's a hashtag saying jiu-jitsu for everyone are you saying that that's not true <laughs> But it's about the individual person finding their own their own niche, if that makes sense. You know, it's I've had people come to me and I've had people come to me and you see them on a set of pads and they look, you think, oh my God. You know what I mean? And they, I've seen them on pads and I've almost wanted, I've been scared to spar with them. And the sparring session comes around, I think, oh my God, I'm going to get filled in here. As soon as we spar, they go to pieces. It's just not for them, you know? 
So it's down to that style of um, understanding your own personal needs and then developing it. I feel that I need uh, the physical contact. I feel that I need that, the constant grind, everyday grind, because I need something in my life. And I think it's because of my background coming up through from the Marines into close protection, into the security industry, maritime security. I needed that edge, you know, and then MMA coming all the way through. And then um, I thought, you know, I, mean, I still need that push in life. I think if I stop, I'll probably go a little bit cuckoo and I'll have um, a few more issues and my issues will surface a little bit more, if that makes sense. So for yeah. me, other people, other people don't like contact. There are people that don't like, like contact. Um, again, it's down to trying to find out what is good for the individual. Yeah, I, I think we're losing that, that like innate ability to have, a, you know, as you see it in kids, you know, uh, the way it's kind of this it's um, discouraged that they have a bit of rough and tumble, especially boys yeah. like rolling around on the floor and, and play fighting, etc. And it should be encouraged. And yeah. uh, it's something that's actively encouraged in my house with all, all three of them, where, you know, we go in the lounge, take the cushions off the settee and we have a bit of rough house, you know, <laughs> and they all get flung around, you know, just so <laughs> they know what it's like, you know, to be gripped and grabbed, et cetera. And they don't panic next, the next time somebody does put them in that situation. Based on your kind of extensive experience with MMA and, you, and a fantastic record that you got with it, and especially in, in, in the early days, what's your opinion on the, 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 the effectiveness of pure jiu-jitsu in MMA? R Ryan, I only asked because Ryan Hall came out recently and just said that it doesn't work in his experience. But, you know, his, I would say his MMA record isn't as big as yours. What's your experience of it? Um, I'm not, I mean, being five foot six and I got little arms like T-Rex, you know what I mean? <laughs> striking, striking for me, unless the person was actually, I was sat on top of the person, striking wasn't always necessarily the go-to position for me. Um, so for me, it was always about using striking kicks and punches to close the gap, to get clinch. Once I got clinch, I can initiate the takedown. If I got the takedown, then hopefully I could strike on the floor, um, and, hopefully submit somebody so i'll either win by knockout on the floor or tko or get a submission but um for me it was all about that clinch which is grappling um and also when you hit the floor about the pressure the control was on the floor so yes from his point of view maybe he struggles with the submissions um it is what it is now but i think there's, there's so many different aspects within jiu-jitsu that are in play within MMA, not just the submissions. Can you control somebody? Can you pass the submission? Can you, um, can you prevent them from attacking you? Can you prevent them from eating you? And a lot of these people don't do... Um, I talk to my guys all the time, and, we, and every time I show a technique, I always also take into account where my face is in relation to their body, and I talk about, um, can the person hit me? Can they cause me damage? You know what I mean? Whilst I'm doing this technique, um, and, and I'll show techniques and that, and every time I'm doing it, my head's buried. And, and so I'm always a very, very low pressure game. And I'm burying my head because I'm very aware of my face. I'm very aware of getting punched. Um, so I think it's down to the individual. And I think it's, it's, I don't think it's not a case if it doesn't work because it does work. Um, and there are so many exponents of BJJ out there that have proven it works. Mm. Um, but it's, again, it's the context in which it's used um against the appropriate person i've had fights where i've not been able to use my jiu-jitsu i've had fights where i've been able to use my jiu-jitsu uh, i've had fights where i've submitted people and i've also had fights where i've been able to control somebody stop them or prevent them from submitting me but then use my jiu-jitsu control game to hammer fist them until they've gone unconscious you know so it, it, it it's down to the individual i personally think um you know and i think that's where um yeah, I, I think if you're going to, I personally think jiu-jitsu is a major part of MMA, in my personal opinion, um, because it suits my needs. Um, and a lot of my, a lot of my fighters have got a really, really dominant, strong jiu-jitsu game. Um, that's because of the way I train, but they've also got a formidable striking game as well. So, yeah. It's, just, it's, it's down to your body mechanics and your height. Yeah. Your, way, yeah. your, your, your yeah. body type, etc. It can it can be yeah. applicable to you on, on those kind yeah. of variables. Yeah. Yeah. And the good thing about the ground is we're, we're all equal. I personally think, you know, stood up and have I got somebody who's six foot? He's got a longer reach than me. Um, I'm not going to be able to tag him. It's going to be a lot harder to tag him. I'm going to have to take damage on the way in. 
when we hit the floor, then basically, it, although it's not 100% 50-50, it, it balances it out a little bit more, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, what's, it, what's it like running the school? What's it like being the kind of the figure point and the head honcho? How does that responsibility settle on your shoulders? Um, yeah, I used, to, I used to do it as a, as a full-time job. Um, but then uh, I got married children all that type of stuff and I realized there wasn't enough money in the gym for me when I lived on my own and I was doing security work and other bits and the rest of it um I could live off of it but then I realized how to get myself a job um that's when I went into doing what I do now um the 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 figurehead side of it um the responsibility I've gone COVID was a good thing for me COVID was really really good uh because it allowed me to cleanse the gym um we went from a lot of members not under, not very many members um and then it allowed me to re-establish the gym um and also break away from fighters if that makes sense uh i'm on that stage of my life now if people want to come in and fight i've got no problem with that um i don't want to be spending my weekends away with fighters because you know i mean like this weekend i could be spending with my wife and my kids um i don't want to be doing any of that type of stuff so. Wait, sorry about that, Mark. A little bit of a technical issue there. We were talking about uh, cleansing the gym. Yeah, um, I, I don't mean that in a an adverse way um, because I have lots of fighters and all the rest of it. And I, I got to the stage in my life that I wanted to teach martial arts because of my love for martial arts, if that makes sense. Um, so a lot of people left and they went to other gyms, which is really quite cool for me. Um, and then I started putting all my effort into my teens program. Um, and then one of the things that happened as well, because of the, the COVID lockdown, you could, I couldn't really teach BJJ on Zoom. Um, it was a bit of a weird one, but because I've got a background in Jeet Kune Do and Muay Thai, what I found is I could, I could teach um, striking on Zoom. So what we did then was we picked together, um, I started using the, the JKD or the Jun Fan syllabus for kickboxing. Um, for my teens and then when obviously we came back to having the physical contact again they just spent all that time doing striking and doing all the drills i thought it's unfair to get rid of all of that and then make them do grappling again so what i did was i crossed the two the two arts so it's almost like an eye breed mma jeet Kune Do style class that they do now um so they do grappling and striking and it seems to have worked wow how, how did you um how did you come across Pedro Bassa? Because I can obviously we can see it on your top at the moment. So that's <laughs> yeah, obviously yeah. that's your yeah. Pedro Bassa yeah. is your lineage, and that's you know who yeah. he presented you with your black belt. I take it he presented me with my black belt. Yeah, yeah. So how uh, did you how did you guys meet? What how did that come about? Um, there's a gentleman in Exeter called Andy Costello. Um, Andy Costello, I met through MMA. He was on the circuit. He fought on Cage Rage and a couple of other big shows. And he told me that he had this young Brazilian teaching at his gym in Exeter. And would I like to go? So I thought, oh, there's a Brazilian teaching up there. Of course I'll go. Um, so I went up. Um, I got on with him really well at, at, straight away. Um, at the time, people used to struggle with pitting me chokes on me. And people used to struggle with rear naked chokes. And that. So I thought I was infallible. And I thought, nobody can choke me. Um, of course, Andy Costello highlighted this fact to Pedro. And then Pedro then proceeded to choke the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> as you do. <laughs> as you do, yeah. That's when I realised well, I wasn't as good as I thought I was. What and belt was, were you then? Uh, I was a blue belt. Oh, ah, okay. Blue belt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, and then, yeah, I went from there and then he asked me if I'd be interested. Well, we met a few more times and he asked me if I'd like to join his organisation, which I did. Um uh i stayed uh, then i got to purple belt and then i went out to the worlds with him um at purple belt and i competed in the worlds which was quite good no gi um got to meet um other people in the states we went down to san diego and we trained with um rodrigo menderes and his team which was really really cool i met people like carlson gracie jr clark gracie and all those types of people on the mat joe tudor um so there were some really really big names down there and it was really really good what are they um, like? What are they, the Gracies, when you meet these? What are they like? Are they quite intimidated? Are they intense? Are they full of energy? How would you sum them up? Um, I, 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 personally, I, I personally 
Um, the, the only one I've, out of all the Gracies that I've met, I've had a really, really good relationship with because it's been a, um, uh, um, what was it? it's just been one of those casual relationships. We sit and talk and all the rest of it. Um, the only one I never had a, a relationship with, and it's not no negativity to it, or it was because it was always Gracie, because I never got to hang out with him. I never got to go off and do stuff with it. Did it make sense? So I never got to build that relationship. Um, I only saw him on seminars. I traveled around the country to his seminars when he was doing the, the, um, the UK networking. Um, yeah, not a problem. I knew him. I could speak to him and all the rest of it, but we never had a chance to build that rapport. Now, I, know, I have friends that are part of Voice Gracie's network now, um, and, and they've got that rapport with him, you know, which is really, really good for them because I think you need that. Um, but yeah, I got to go for coffees with people like Carl Swan Gracie Jr., um, Clark Gracie, Clark Gracie. You know, they've both been in my gym. Um, and talk for me in my gym, um, which is really, really cool. Um, yeah, I, I always found them to be really, really cool. Um, and they just want to be your friend and they want to do stuff with you and they want to make you better. And so, yeah, I've always, I've always got really well with every bit I've met. So, yeah. Do you think that's like the, the cultural thing with the Brazilians? Uh, you know, as opposed to judo, because your background was in judo as well. And yeah. uh, I used to I used to go to like open mat judo and Coventry a few times. And it's very strict and it's quite regimented. And then you go to like, a, you know, you go to a BJJ class and it's the complete opposite. You know, like it's, yes, there is structure, you know, but it's yeah. very chilled. And I remember chatting to uh, Jeff Lawson about this. And he says, that's because the Brazilians, are, they're beautiful. They're free. They're surfers. Yeah. They're you know, they're chilled out yeah. dudes, you know, hey brother, welcome, whereas Judah's a bit like that, right, come on. <laughs> yeah, I think also a lot of it as well, is a lot of that structure is probably pit in by the Western world, um, so again, you probably find that it's our society that's done that, if that makes sense. Um, I, I've never been to a Japanese dojo, I don't see how they, I'm not, I couldn't tell you how they do it in the Japanese dojo, so I can't uh, make a conclusion on that but i would say a lot of it is done by people over here because a lot of people they get black belts and then they want everybody to line up for them and it's so is that type of thing if that makes sense i don't i don't make anybody line up in my gym um we're all there together regardless of rank we're all there because we want to learn uh, regardless of age or anything like that there we have a laugh together we pay respect to each other we shake everybody's hands at the end of it we come and we fist bump at the beginning um the, yeah so as long as we're nice to each other, does it really matter? Do I need people lining up and bowing? I'm like, ah, I mean, the only time I get people to line up, and that's if I've got a guest instructor in, then I'll get them to line up. And that's purely because I don't know what the guest instructor wants and how relaxed they are about it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. What's the kind of like general ethos of the gym? Is it, but especially when it comes to kind of like rolling, is it just the case of, find you find yourself on the mat or you know do you like would you only have like the white belts and the blue belts roll with each other and then the high belts can come and say right i'll roll with you or is it just a case of i right, get on the mat and just get with whoever and then you'll learn soon enough that there is a hierarchy etc there's no segregation in my gym whatsoever a white belt can roll with a black belt i'll roll with anybody in my gym it does not matter there's no segregation whatsoever uh we tried to get away from that um well i'm a brown belt i don't want to roll with you type thing you're beneath me um it's not about that it's about we, we were all white belts once if that makes sense mm. um one of the things i started doing when i was rolling with people as well on a gi night was i i wouldn't wear my belt on the mats i'll just go with my jacket open um because there was they, they, i almost found them different because they were rolling with a black belt if that makes sense um, and I'm no different to them. I'm no different to my 17-year-old uh, blue belts. You know, I mean, I've got a couple of 17-year-old blue belts. Um, I'm no different to them. And the other thing I do as well, I say, I tell them straight. I said, when we're on the maximum we're rolling, I want a fight as well. If you're not fighting me because you're too scared or you're being respectful or whatever, that's actually, in my mind, being disrespectful because I want to fight. I want to train. I want to escape positions. I want to get caught in things and learn how to escape it. I want to be able to recognize that potentially I'm putting myself at risk because maybe I turned the wrong way. And the only way I'm going to learn that is by people putting pressure on me and beating the crap out of me, you know? And that's it, you know? And, and that's why I want everybody to give me an hour time on the mats. And I want them to give everybody else an hour time because I would much rather we have an hour time on the mats. And I feel that we have a duty of care. If I go and compete or 
situation arises or whatever, and I have to use my jujitsu or my, any other skill I have, and I can't pull it off because my training partners have been a bit slack on me, then that's down to them as much as it is down to me. Because mm. I keep them with the intentions of them training me and making me better. And the only way that's going to happen is, is by them fighting me. You know, um, I, I've got, um, uh, I like doing things. I got one particular lad that loves to darts, absolutely loves darting. Because of, of him darting, I mean, constantly all the time, he, it, because he's putting me under pressure all the time, he's trying to turn my head off, basically. Um, I, I've, been, I've developed a really dynamic escapes. And because of that, but that wouldn't have happened if he was being soft with me, you know? Um, rear naked chokes again, because I'll, a lot of my fights now, I'll start, I'll, I'll start with them on my back. Um, because I want to give the, the not necessarily give them, um, because I'm the higher rank, I should start in a, in a more shit position. Um, I actually did that uh, last weekend with Mick Tully, actually. We rode and I gave him my back and we started the position from there. Um, and then it's my job to escape. It's my job to escape and then it's my job to then to initiate my attack, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, and that's what's really going to happen by the person. And if I escape because the person is not really, really putting their effort into it because they're worried because I'm a black belt or whatever, then they're doing me a disjustice and I'm not getting better because of it. If they catch me, fucking good effort. Then I'll go out on my way to understand how they caught me and then I'll make sure it doesn't happen again. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I've chatted to a few black belts about this and said, oh, you know, do you get tapped by blue belts, blue belts? And they go, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and they said, but see, look, repeat the scenario 10 times and it's probably going to happen once because they learn yeah. so quick from yeah. from that you know and, yeah. and I've this I've had this discussion with Steve my own coach if I get something on him I can already see the cogs you know metaphorically or proverbially turning in his head going he's never going to get that again and they never do like that's it it's gone that little moment gone. of victory yeah. is gone you identified you just... that minute little space <laughs> yeah. you hit something in it you got it I now know I've got to close that door yeah Once, every time yeah. I close yeah. that door and then, but the thing is, we're all, we're all, none of us are um, impossible to tap, you know. And the only way you're going to, you're going to become good is by putting yourselves in, in positions where you are constantly at risk, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then identify the risk and being able to do something about eliminate the risk. Yeah. It's, it was funny because I was, I was rolling with Steve last night and, um, you know, we were having some good sparring and we're all getting ready for the British competition up in Warwick Uni. And, um, you know, like it was, I think the fifth or sixth roll into it with, you know, different people. I ended up with Steve and uh, the, the pace he set from the beginning was ferocious, you know, and you're tired and, and you, you instantly think, because you can, you can kind of pay lip service and you just think, I'm just going to relax this role. But he sets that pace where you, you can't. And then the next thing you know, it's like, right, I'm getting arm barred. Or, oh, I'll have a little bit of success. Now I've just been yeah. knee barred. And then next thing, it's like I got caught with, he did this thing where he, he lapelled my arm and then arm barred me again through the lapel of my own gi jacket. And I'd never yeah. even done that. And he, you know, and it was just like, oh, this is, <laughs> this is so degraded. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then, and then you, but you keep going and you keep pushing, but then you'll have a role with him like in a week's time and, and he might be working on something and he might give you that additional space so you pass, et cetera, and you, you yourself get a bit more confident. Um, but it's, it's important because you need to know um, and us like need to feel it because we train harder, we push him hard, but he pushes us hard and he can switch it on at any and we get that feeling like oh is he gonna really switch it on today and mangle us or is he kind of like gonna let us you know learn something and, and then we've got a black belt that comes in Elliot and it's just like you know it's like that scene from Indiana Jones you know in the Temple of Dune it's like when you drink the blood you fall into a nightmare and you don't wake up from the nightmare <laughs> every roll with him is painful. Yeah. Know? And I remember one of the lads who was a white belt, he like, he stuck a wrist lock on him and he goes, uh, well, I didn't think you were uh, supposed to put wrist locks on white belts. He goes, I'm a black belt. I'll do what the fuck I want. <laughs> I, I have that same argument. You know what I mean? I have, again, I teach jujitsu. I don't teach IBJJF. 
that, you know? Yeah, yeah. You do a competition, you read the rules of the competition, and then if you make a mistake in the competition and break one of those rules, so be it, you're a fool. Because if you look at things like um, cage rage, back in the day, you weren't allowed to elbow on the ground. Right. Okay? But it was full contact, everything like MMA. And then you look at other MMA shows, you're allowed to elbow on the ground. You know, so when you go into these shows, you've got to read the rules. You've got to understand the rules. Does that mean I then don't train elbows because you don't elbow in cage rage? No, because I fought on different platforms. If I went off and did, um, I don't know, Polaris, I wouldn't be allowed to do these things. So yeah. I, I teach my guys from the very beginning, leg locks, all the rest of it, all the way through wrist locks, all the way through, um, because I don't want to get people to, like, say, for instance, a brown belt, and then, oh, yeah, you can do all these different lock locks and the rest of it. Now we've got to retrain you, because they could potentially go against somebody who's been a brown belt for many, many years and got quite a good game, if that makes sense. Uh, um, one of the things I do as well and that is I tend to keep to the same submission for about a month. Um, so I'll come in, I think, right, at the moment I'm working baseball joke. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll rule my guys and the first couple of weeks I'll just smash them with the baseball joke. Okay, catch them three, four times in a row. Um, and then they identify, they think, right, he's working on baseball chokes now. Then all of a sudden they know I won't go for anything else. I'll just go for the baseball joke. And then all of a sudden they start building their defense up against that baseball joke. And now what I do, okay. So then what I've got to do is I've got to learn to build up my attack towards their defense, if that makes sense. Um, and then I get to myself where I can get to the point or I'm trying to get myself to the point where I'm trying to develop that game and I can try to do that technique at will. I don't want it to be a, um, oh, I take whatever submissions offered to me. If that makes sense? Mm -hmm. that, I'll do, that, that I may do into sometimes I'll do that. I'll just take the submissions, whatever's offered to me and vice versa. But sometimes I like to train for a good month, a particular technique, whether it be gi or new gi, because you can do baseball choke on both. Um, and I was doing it last night um, and, I, and I was catching people with it um, purely and simply because it allows me to develop it. Now, I also know their defense towards it's going to get better. So then I have to develop my attack more, if that makes sense. And that's the only way I'm going to get better by doing that. Yeah, I like that. Um, I also like what you said previously when we had a chat about, like, you know, promotion and stuff like that, because you're not a big believer in the kind of stripes. No. Um, for me, I got rid of the strokes now. It's, um, I think the, the biggest hindrance that ever happened to me was getting given my black belt, okay? Because the moment I got given my black belt, everybody saw me as, oh, let's promote me. Uh, you can promote me now. You can promote me now. You know, it was that type of thing. Um, yeah, it was really, really quite weird. For, for me, it was a weird, a weird time in my life. Um, and we used to do, um, uh, a couple of times a year, we would do like get togethers and we do like stripes and all the rest of it. And then what happened was our group started growing and I've got a couple of satellite schools under me and all this type of stuff. And then we'd all get together. Um, I never really have any control of, I'm not very good with admin from the point of view of logging what days people turn up, but they'd all turn up to the, the get together because they did get a stripe. And then what you do is you get a, I don't know, a blue belt with four stripes. That's maybe only training once a week. And then you may have a blue belt with two stripes, but he's training five days a week and he's far better than the other guy and you want to promote him to purple belt. OK, um, but then the guy that's got the four stripes starts complaining because well, I got four stripes. Why is he getting it before me? And those types of things were happening. And they were almost coming in as well with their belts and almost like shaking them in front of me. So, um, right. it, was, it was really, really, really quite weird. It was really, really quite I weird. I can't imagine that. I cannot oh, imagine that. Oh, people, yeah, people, it's just weird. <laughs> so I turned and said, let's just abolish, abolish. So I abolished the, the get-togethers. I just got rid of it because for me, it was just... It was just like a money making, I and mean, I'm not really into that, you know. What I mean, it was just a every six months we'd all get together, everybody pay ten pound or whatever. Um, I understand uh, Pedro does that, and it works really, really well for Pedro. For me, it didn't work because Pedro is much more organised than me, and he can make it work. But Pedro doesn't do stripes either. Um, he's got he, he got rid of the stripe thing as well. Um, but for me, it was just it wasn't for me. I just wasn't. I'm just not. <laughs> my admin's crap. You know what I mean? My admin's really, really crap. And me remembering who does what, who deserves what, it, it was just a nightmare. Um, you know what I mean? Pedro's quite quite switched on with stuff, you know what I mean? So for him, it was, a, it was a walk in the park. And he's also got a massive team around him as well, which he's quite lucky for me. I'm on my own. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, and then what I wanted to do now is just sometimes I wanted to promote somebody in class. So I thought, well, if I get rid of the stripes, and I just promote people as and when in, in classes, you know, 
But what I then started doing was I started speaking to everybody else within the group. So it became like a, a communal promotion. Um, and I'd go around to everybody and say, oh, I'm thinking of Bob over there. He's doing really, really well. What do you think? Do you think he's worth the next belt? And then people say, yeah, or nay or whatever. And if I got any nays, um, we wouldn't promote him. If they all said yes, the old group collectively, we would then promote him. And that's, that's how I started doing it because then it was more of a, it wasn't necessarily my decision. It was like um, everybody in the group, all his peers and all the rest of it, they all agreed that that person was doing really, really well. So that's why we went down that route because the other routes and the other, um, everybody seems to have their own set standard of how they do this. Um, for me, it just didn't work. It, I was having so many problems with it and then, because I had my satellite schools and I had all these other problems with that there for me, it was just the only people I could really, really manage were the people in my group mm. and they were the people I had control over. If that makes sense. Mm. Um, the satellite mm. schools, I didn't know they'd be training every week. I didn't know what level their grappling skills were at because they weren't rolling with me or my, or my team, my, my direct team members um, and my other black belts. So it became really, really hard for me to judge where they were, if that makes sense. And I, I just, in the end, I just broke and I went, I can't do this anymore. And I just abolished the lot. And it's, but, but it's easier now, yeah? Oh, it's so much easier now. Yeah, it's so much easier now. So, yeah. So I still, I'll still still promote a person in class. I'll turn around and say, um, how, long, how well is that person doing? I'll then check how long they've been, the, the belt they are at that time. If, if the timelines are about right, if the timelines aren't right, then I'll make them last a bit. I'll make them wait a bit longer. They don't know we're doing this, but I'll talk to everybody else and say, what do you think? I'll say, potentially, we can now look at promoting this person. What's your view? You know, and we, yeah. we do it like yeah. that. So, and everybody gets to say, regardless of rank. Wow, that's interesting. Hmm. Okay, Mark, what we're going to have to do, we're going to have to do a part two. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we're, running, right. we're running out of time, mate. Um, so we'll pause it here for today. Uh, we'll get a session in hopefully next week where we'll do, uh, you know, the second episode. I've said this to Steve yeah. as well. Um, I feel like I'm only scratching the surface, but uh, how the kind of how the kind of time frame works is it's usually like an hour's chat. But I feel like we literally are just scratching the surface. There's so much more I want to ask you, um, you know. So, yeah. So if we, can we book in for part two in the future? Yeah, of course you can. No problem. Super. Okay, mate, brilliant. It's a, a lot less painful than I thought it would be. Yeah, so yeah, it's just chatting, mate. It's just chatting. <laughs> well, listen, thanks very much for your time. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and I'll speak to you soon.